Today I'll be focusing on the food um, side of what we do, food for humans in this instance, and breaking old food paradigms to try and get people to eat a little bit more seaweed. You're probably aware there was seaweed in two of the dishes at the lunch today. One in the salad, there was a nori, some of the um, Asian, Southeast Asian produced seaweed, uh, as well as in some of the desserts. There were um, some carrageens and, and gels that made the gel, um, nice jellies that we had. But um, leading on from that, and seaweed is a global crop already. It's already a large global crop. Um, you, it's only a young one, though. The first seaweed farms were only established in Japan in the 1940s when the life cycle of the nori that you eat around your sushi rolls was broken by an English uh, phycologist. Phycologist, phy phyco meaning algae, the people who study algae. Uh, when she broke that life cycle, the Japanese took that technology on and developed seaweed farms. And those nori um, seaweed farms are some of the highest value seaweed farms now around the world, fetching prices of about $70 a kilo for some of them. But we also have a number of lower commodity valued seaweeds producing food ingredients such as carrageen. And you can see that here um, on the graph that um, the brown seaweeds um, were most probably well known as the kelps and wakamis of the world that took off and, and were the biggest until recently when the red producing seaweeds that make carrageen took, took over. You can see here there's the green seaweeds, there's three distinct categories of seaweeds, really haven't been exploited and that's the one that we're trying to exploit here. I didn't see a reason to try and compete with nori or wakame and those seaweeds. Australia need to come up with its own story and uh, green seaweed has a, a number of competitive attributes that we're trying to exploit. If you look at the global seaweed production in terms of biomass, far, far away out, out, uh, supersedes uh, mollusks, brackish fish and marine fish in terms of biomass produced. It's quite large. It's over a $6 billion global crop and Australia's growing none of it until now. A bit of retrospective work that I did, I've um, uh, been looking at seaweeds from a remediation perspective linked to aquaculture since the 1990s um, in Sri Lanka. but but. Remediation wasn't something that I see anyone was going to be paying for or buying or adopting. You can preach till the cows come home as an academic as you should be cleaning up the world with seaweed, but that wasn't going to work. So then I started to look at how does seaweed have a value in itself? While it's doing the cleaning up, we'll put that aside, what are the values we can sell seaweed for? So I did some work with the Rural Industries R&D Corporation um, looking at what are the market potential for seaweeds um, in Australia. And um, these are the predictions we did about eight years ago, looking at pharmaceuticals, very high, but a longer term trajectory to market. And the fertilizers, they're actually already happening. Um, you know that you have to put sea salt on your garden. So, but those are a you know, very short term, but a lower value. So we were focusing a little bit in the middle here around the food nutrition um, area. And indeed, that's what we are commercializing today. I continued that research. These reports are available through the Rurdic website. Um, on which seaweeds to grow, screening seaweeds in Australia, doing the genetic barcoding on seaweeds to resolve the taxonomy of them. Indeed, we've got as many unique species in our ocean in Australia as we do on land. Um, and uh, some really nice hotspots in different states as well for different species diversities. So this is a real new marketing opportunity for Australia. Um, I will then FRDC also helped support in collaboration with Rurdic um, the development of a Seaweeds Australia newsletter. I was probably a little bit before my time to have an industry newsletter without a real industry. But um, it ran for three years and it's still popular but it was relying on blood, sweat and tears a lot. So um, I might revisit that as the industry burgeons and we can get levies maybe one day. But um, uh, those, those reports are available too because there are a number of groups around Australia doing research and development on seaweed production in a diff number of different scenarios, number of different species, and a number of different products. And just this year, last year in December, um, the FRDC and ABARES um, actually uh, highlighted for the first time that seaweed would be an aquaculture product for Australia of about 5,000 tonnes in 2021 to 22. So I would like to uh, you know, <laughs> explain here to Patrick that they, we're on the well on the way to achieving that. Um, that's what I'll present here quickly. Um, why seaweed though? It's got basically where I'm coming from is the sustainability values of seaweed. Um, and seaweeds capture carbon dioxide, so we can actually inject and absorb carbon dioxide into the biosphere much faster than many other crops, land crops. Um, 
and, uh, and we are currently in Venus Shell Systems bottling that CO2 um, for food, um, cosmetic products, and even supplements we've done clinical studies um, on. This is our current business model and the markets that we're focusing on. Um, so our message is no longer so much focusing on the sustainability, that's a background tick, but it's about superior quality from Australia for better health applications is what we're really doing a lot of um, our marketing and research efforts on. But just back to the sustainability a little bit, we're actually currently in our pilot system closing the loop on a wheat refinery. I used to remediate nutrients from aquaculture, now I remediate nutrients from wheat refinery. This is one of the largest um, wheat refineries in um, Australia, it's on the south coast of New South Wales and it's a major ethanol producer from the waste that it produces. Um, so natural waste is fermented to ethanol and we capture the carbon dioxide from that um, industry at the moment. Um, we're currently not big enough to keep 350 tonnes of it a day, so we're not at a scale that we can capture all of that yet, but as we scale up, we will be. Um, you can see here that the, the uh, companies, Shoalhaven Starches or Manildra Group, and we catch their CO2 stream. Not only that, they actually have a wastewater, eight megalitres of wastewater a day, and they recover six megalitres of water from that to potable water. The remainder is a concentrated nutrient that's actually a bit salty because wheat is naturally salty, and we capture that as well. So we're closing the loop on those waste products from wheat, and our waste products are clean water and oxygen. So we're adding sun, CO2 nutrients to seawater, and Venus Shell Systems is our company that grows the seaweed. We then process it to dried weight products. We do a milled green powder, and we have built a pilot processing factory as well in a decommissioned paper mill on the Shoalhaven River. Um, and we've done an enriched protein powder. Our rich seaweed's got an original protein content of 40%. Um, and we also do medical grade extracts as well. We, uh, brand those under a name of a uh, range of ingredients. And we partner with a number of people in the Shoalhaven area. We've created an industry hub with local council and a number of companies. And we call that hub Blue Biotech Shoalhaven. We want the region to recognise itself as a clean, green biotech region that collaboratively can deliver products in this innovative area today. Um, we, uh, through that network, we are able to put the sun into a skin product bottle within a 10 kilometre radius and, and get that. We'll have our first thousand units produced next week um, to test on the market. Uh, we're already m marketing test amounts of the food and we've done clinical trials on supplements that we're now going through TGA approval processes for. This is a website for our local um, Blue Biotech Shoalhaven hub. You can see the companies that are in the Shoalhaven that we collaborate with. We rely very much on Shoalhaven Water as our utility company for the great wastewater management that they do have in our catchment zone that allows the Shoalhaven to promote itself as the clean um, marine source of uh, products. Oysters as well growing in that area. Um, Essence Group, actually 10 kilometres from our facility, they f manufacture a lot of the supplements for big companies in Australia, and we're now able to locally manufacture supplements. Um, and uh, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries as well is a, is a regulatory body, but I see that in Australia we should be embracing our regulatory bodies because we're selling quality because we have those regulatory bodies. So creating a good relationship with those authorities is vital and really beneficial to us. Um, so this for me is an important network with an industrial capacity. They have knowledge that I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel on how to formulate and manufacture a skin product as well as grow the seaweed, so we partner and we make the products together. Um, regulatory alignment, and someone gave me this word the other day, that in, in potential competition with some of these com companies and, um, and other seaweed um, producing um, industries in Australia, but really we're not in competition. We, we call it cooperation. I think um, Australia should really embrace that concept a bit more. Um, and this is about regional development, this, this partnership as well, because it's one of the highest uh, regional unemployment areas with a large Aboriginal population as well. But what's exciting is the market's ready today. 20 years ago, this might not have worked. 
but today um, it really is. People are looking for um, health and nutritional um, solutions as well as exciting new food solutions. Um, we've been picked up on the BBC, by the BBC for events with Michael Mosley. We presented at the Rabobank Farm, um, Farm to Fork event last year. Um, and I'm even publishing in some really good literature now, these days. Um, we'll be launching a new e-commerce website um, in, the, in the next couple of months with the three categories of our products. You can actually market food, skin and diet supplement products alongside each other today because these are not like the pharma drug company kind of things anymore. You can eat your skin products these days as well. So putting these kinds of things alongside each other with the seaweed story behind them in sort of whole foods type stores is what we're trying to aim to do, as well as launch direct to customers through e-commerce platforms, which if you get them right, are incredibly powerful. So our core message is that FICO Food creates fun food that makes seaweed easy to eat. We're putting it into things like the pasta because we don't want you to be, have to be a connoisseur to get your seaweed. I found that when I had a bag of green smelly powder on the shelf, people were like fascinated, but what do they do with it? That wasn't a marketing solution. So we've actually put it into things that you would normally use in your kitchen. And even things like dukkah, you'd be aware of dukkah. Um, we won a gold medal for our fuka. Everything uh, starts with pH in our company. Um, so we're already on the radar of Australian National Fine Food Awards. This is just an example of the fettuccine that we've launched and is even popular with the children. Um, this was uh, sea spirals we did for the BBC event. Um, and, but why, are we, why is it so important to put seaweed into the mainstream food that we already have? Because it's potent nutritionally. A lot of our mainstream processed foods are deficient in, in uh, a range of things, including minerals and trace elements. Omega-3 is the source of, uh, seaweed is the source of omega-3. Uh, salmon don't make it themselves, they get it from the food chain. Um, dietary fibre, we're chronically uh, deficient in dietary fibre in the West. We're only getting at 50% if that of what we require for good gut flora. And we've been doing clinical trials on that. And protein, 40% protein. This is important because 35% of Australians will be obese in 2025, and I'm not overweight, obese. And this is challenging hunger um, as the greatest form of malnutrition in the world. And with the current manufactured food system, how are we going to change that? How are we going to get trace elements back in the soils? How are we going to change the whole food production paradigm? It's very hard to. So how do we inject something in that to address these issues? And seaweed, you don't have to eat a lot of it to get the benefits of it. Just 5 to 10 percent in your pasta will create some of the nutrition, will deliver some of those nutritional um, solutions. Uh, one thing we focus on, therefore, is making sure we measure and monitor and know what our trace elements are in our seaweed. This is important as well for nutritional reasons as well as safety. So one company, for example, in, in Asia put too much kelp of a high iodine content into a soy milk product, and now there's a, there was a, um, a class action in Australia against that company because seaweed hasn't been well re regulated. This is Australia's opportunity to be leaders in the regulation and the quality and the knowledge around seaweed. We might not be the biggest, but we can be the best. This is omega-3 profiles of our seaweed. And you can see down here our omega-3 in the green to the omega-6 ratio in our particular seaweed. We can maintain that and guarantee a very high omega-3 content. And I'll come back to that in a little minute. In a minute. This is the um, amino acid profile of our seaweed. You can see we have all of the essential amino acids in this, and at 40% 40, 40 protein, people probably didn't realise that seaweed could be um, a significant protein source, also with B, vitamin B12, so it's a vegetarian um, solution as well. We actually um, overcome some iodine and iron deficiencies um, in people already through some of the snack foods that we make. Going back to the omega-3, we've been doing work with the abalone industry which currently fed formulated feeds from land crops gives them a high omega-6 um, profile in, their, in the abalone tissue. You eat seafood because of the omega-3. That's the story we hear. But if it's, if it's farmed from land crops, it reflects a land crop profile of high omega-6. So we actually, through putting seaweed into the diet, increase the omega-3 ratio to over 2 to 1. This is just an example of some of the um, 
supplements that we're doing. Uh, we reduced cholesterol, inflammation, insulin requirements, and the gut flora in 65 people in Nowra uh, on a six-week trial of seaweed extract supplements. Um, and in summary of all of this, from our production to our fork or products at the end, um, seaweed can be one of the most efficient production systems um, for food. We can do 100 tonnes dry weight per hectare an annum. That's 1,000 tonnes wet weight per hectare an annum. It's about 20 times that of any other land crop. Uh, we complete nutrition and very concentrated nutrition. And we can assure um, genetic traceability to the genes, even the sun rays. We're actually monitoring the sun rays and it can be through this vertical system the most traceable product on the shelf in the world. Um, this is just an example of the skincare products that we're launching this year. We do research at the University of Wollongong with students showing increased wound healing rates. This is how cells recover into an artificial wound uh, compared to not having our seaweed extract in, in the creams. And we're also working with the university on some more blue sky ideas around tissue um, printing, uh, printing skin cells, um, regenerative medicine, implants, um, coating titanium implants to um, make them more biocompatible and that sort of thing. So there's some blue sky stuff for the future. We've been moseying along at about three tonnes of dry weight, 30 tonnes per wet, wet weight per hectare um, uh, at the moment per annum. Um, and we're right in the stage of trying to um, scale to about a two hectare production facility next year, which will give us uh, 200 tonnes dry weight or 2,000 tonnes wet weight of seaweed in a year. Um, and uh, we're working on the investment side of all of that at the moment. But we're just building on an Australian legacy because the earliest history in the world of using seaweed was from water carriers in Tasmania 35,000 years ago. That's a summary of seaweed uh, future. Thank you.